What's it like to study something as intangible as culture? Back in the fall, I had the opportunity to visit the Cultural Developmental Science Lab at McGill University, and I got to speak to Dr. Kristoff and his team about their research. So I'm gonna take you along as I learn more about their research process, some cool findings, how they got involved in research, and how you can too. So we don't have a single research question, and we go out and we collect data to answer that narrow question, because it's not necessarily it takes time to get people in the field, to recruit, to get families interested. Um, so we generally uh, think about populations we're interested in. Um, so interested in understanding the uh, risk and resilience and mental health of black families in Quebec. So we want that population, the population comes first. A lot of research done at the CDS lab is survey based, so unlike an experiment, a bunch of different data is collected at once. Participants are invited to answer questions about their experiences, feelings, and behaviors. Researchers then look at what gaps there are in the things they're studying, so this could be something like how culturally informed coping impacts anxiety. So they build models to understand how different factors are related, so this can be something like coping mechanisms and sleep quality. These models are kind of like maps, and the way that the models are tested is by matching the proposed model with the model that is created by the data. For example, imagine I draw a map of Canada that looks like this blob. I then compare it to the actual map of Canada backed up by geographical data points, and I'd realize very quickly that my map sucks. So in the same way, these statistical models would not be very good if they didn't match the data. Because of the nature of a developmental science lab, it's difficult to control all of the variables like age, gender, and social status, so researchers look at these variables afterwards to see if they impacted the results. So that's a very brief overview of the process. The methods used also vary depending on the study. One study in particular looked at the shift and persist model to deal with situations that involve things like anxiety and discrimination. So shift and persist really is studied mostly in the kind of health psychology field and has been shown to be really helpful in the uh, context of uncontrollable stressors. So we think about maybe a kid who is impoverished, right? That kid, especially if they're younger, they don't have a lot of agency or control over getting their family out of poverty. So in that sense, it's an uncontrollable stressor. Um, and research has shown if you shift and persist in the face of uncontrollable stressors, it helps you kind of experience more optimal physical health outcomes in response to that stress. And then my work has kind of taken it and looked at it in the context of discrimination and mental health. And it also seems to be helpful in different ways in the context of mental health. Shifting involves changing your process to better handle the situation, so this would be like going with the flow, whereas persisting would be more like facing the adversity head on and weathering the storm. People use both depending on the situation, but researchers at the CDS lab wanted to test how effective these strategies could be if they were culturally informed. So this involves using things like cultural practices, community support systems, and cultural identity to help deal with challenges. They found that individuals that used this strategy experienced lower anxiety, drank less, and reported better sleep quality. However, discrimination still had some effect on anxiety even when this shift and persist strategy was used. This just means that further studies are needed in this area, some of which are already being done by the CDS lab itself. For example, the lab is now looking at messages parents give to their children about race and ethnicity and how that impacts how youth combat discrimination. When I was an undergrad, I was majoring in child psychology. Um, I grew up in the US, so at the University of Minnesota, and I was always pretty frustrated with the lack of attention to um, the experiences of BIPOC individuals, and particularly across development. I just felt like in a lot of my classes, like our experiences as a person of color and the people I love, like our experiences weren't really reflected in the courses that I was taking. Um, so I just tried to make every effort I could to explore this research area more. Um, I was also lucky though that in undergrad, um, I ended up joining a lab that focused on minority mental health and um, the development of um, BIPOC youth. So that was kind of my first exposure to it. Um, but I guess that's kind of like how I ended up getting invested in this type of work and 
how I ended up doing this grad school route. All right, so what's it like working in this lab? I love it. Um, kind of echoing what Trevor said, the people here are like really nice and it's really great to be able to kind of do the work we actually want because yeah, especially as first year PhD students, that's not always the case. And so it's really great to have the freedom to do this work. Yeah, I so I went to the University of Guelph and I just majored in psychology. And so we didn't actually have a lot of labs like this in my undergrad because it's a predominantly white institution in area in general. And so I kind of focused, I did a lot of research experience coming in, but I mainly focused on getting research experience itself. And so I tried to kind of weave in my interests as much as I could, but really just knew that this is what I wanted to do. And so I found ways to make the research my own, but really just focused on making sure I had the skills to do it when I got in a position where I was able to. So as a psych major, uh, I had a really kind of, uh, a lot of chance and a lot of luck getting a really good research experience with a, a mentor in undergrad. So through a program at my university, I was kind of the one sole full-time summer RA um, on a project essentially doing a program evaluation of a community center in Detroit. So I went to University of Maryland, but this community center is in Detroit and it's called the Detroit's Downtown Boxing Gym. It's basically this uh, community program that was started to one, provide kind of an outlet for uh, inner city kids in Detroit. Uh, Detroit County Public Schools are overwhelmingly filled with uh, minority, racial ethnic minority students, mostly black, um, and have some of the lower kind of educational attainment outcomes relative to other school systems in the country. But this program was one, teaching kids how to box as kind of an outlet for the stressors they were going through and uh, two, for every hour that they spend boxing or doing any kind of physical activity, they were also in uh, tutoring programs. So they brought tutors in from all over uh, Detroit and the state of Michigan. And um, yeah, so it was just a really great research experience, like working with doing focus group interviews with uh, people that were running the program and the kids who were benefiting from the program. And uh, it really solidified some um, ideas that I had kind of wanting to use research and wanting to like go through the psychology route. People from marginalized backgrounds are fairly rare in academia and then people that study those populations are fairly rare. So before that, I didn't even see that that was an option for me. So I think that really kind of opened things up for me personally. So from my undergrad, I went on to a, a clinical psych PhD program at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, when I got in, I really was thinking like, I was very interested in research, but saw myself kind of doing community mental health, again, doing kind of therapy and assessment for, uh, again, kids and families of color primarily. Um, but as the years went on, I just really uh, started to kind of appreciate the research side. I think I was always really interested in the helping professions just from being really young. Both of my parents in different forms and different levels were teachers. Um, my grandpa was a, a phys ed teacher and then both of my parents were uh, language teachers, so French, English, or sorry, French, German, Spanish at different times. So um, they always told me not to be a teacher and I guess I ended up as a professor, so not that far, but I was interested in some type of career that was helping people. This is kind of a little bit of an aside, but like, um... I know you you do a lot of cool things outside the lab as well. Like you're like on the national team for like the French national team for lacrosse and things like that. So I'm just yep. wondering if there's anything else or if you want to talk about that that as well outside the lab that has given you unconventional skills or maybe like um, helped you in terms of your research or mm. even just like your mindset. Help me in terms of research. You know, I'm not, a sh I'm not sure. I would say the athletic side of things. So yeah, I played, I played lacrosse in university and I, I'm a current member of the, the French national lacrosse team, like you said. I think like having that athletic background and still engaging in that as long as my body lets me, I think adds a level of kind of structure into your time that I've had for a while. You know, I have to be doing a certain amount of training each week. Like ideally I'm playing lacrosse as often as I can. It can get a little dicey up here with the weather, but um, you know, playing as much as I can. And that all takes time, uh, like the training and preparation and then the tournaments take time. So I think that 
that athletic background has really helped with things like time management and efficiency. Um, just obviously a, a skill when you are kind of drawn between supervising students, teaching classes, doing research. So I think that's a big one. What tips do you have for people that are like maybe wanting to pursue research or things like that? Yeah, I would say definitely reach out as early as you can. Um, I think, you know, all of the faculty in the department, we mentor various numbers of undergrads and we try to get undergrads involved in different tasks. So I think getting some lab experience if you're interested in kind of moving through the field of psychology is really helpful. And you won't get lab experience by not reaching out to people and actively seeking out those opportunities. So I think prepare, be prepared to maybe not get some responses or get some rejections, but getting that experience, whether it's something you know you're really interested in or maybe you're just trying it out and you realize I'm not interested in this. I think those are both equally valuable experiences and you'll probably get some skills out of either of those. So I would just encourage people to get started as early as possible. And uh, I would probably say too, you know, a lot of people in psychology come into psychology and they think about therapy and they think about clinical psychology and that's really their North Star and all they think about. But there's a really, really like wide range of things you can do in psychology from kind of obviously therapy, client stuff to research. There are a lot of people in kind of human resources. There are people in the nonprofit space. So if you're open to other opportunities, I wouldn't close them off to you. And some of those opportunities might lead you to like things that are not a PhD in clinical psychology, which is I feel like most of what people talk about. It's a great career for many people, but there are probably other careers and other levels of education, uh, like masters or just bachelors that fit people fine and help them do what they want to do. I would say like, just read as much literature as you can, or just kind of like, um, kind of dip your feet in as much as you can. So like, if that means like you read um, certain papers by professors you like, you read about certain content that you're interested in. Um, I would just try to do some reading on your own and kind of get a footing of what you're interested in. If you know what you want to do, it's like very, that's an amazing first step because it's really hard to do that mm -hmm. because the field is so wide, but kind of focusing on getting as close to it as you can. So if you don't have the option, like labs like this, then just focusing on getting the experience so you're able to do it and like weaving in your interests where you can. Like, I don't know, I did research in like business psychology and tried to focus on EDI work, for example, even though that wasn't necessarily what it started as. And so there are always ways to kind of add your twist into things and that seems to be what academia in general is like so it's a pretty good skill to develop in the first place. It was really cool to see these topics that I had thought about on my own to be studied this way and to see how they can potentially impact or help real people. I linked the CDS lab down below in case you want to participate in any of their studies or get involved in their research. And it's also just really inspiring to see people that enjoy their jobs and find meaning in them. So on that cheesy note, go check out these other videos about some other cool things happening at McGill and I will see you next time. Bye!